All right, let's get started. Welcome to lecture 10, Robotics 311. Today, we're going to kind of review DXF creation. We talked about that last lecture. We'll finish up water jetting and talk about their best practices. And then we're going to do an in class example for like most of the class, probably like an hour. And that in class example is going to be kind of like the the only like real example we do together. So in, in the specking process, we did several examples. We walked through different mechanical modeling, through current and voltage together, and kind of like did that to show you the answers. And that helped, I think, kind of go through those problems or learn that material well. But in the manufacturing side, there really like hasn't been a way to do in-class examples. So I want to do that today. I know that you guys are getting some practice of this through your teams, but what I want to make sure is like when there's two people assigned to something, like oftentimes teams will divide and conquer, and that means at least one of you gets like proficient in this, but the goal is for everyone to be proficient in it. So we're gonna spend kind of an hour or 45 minutes today walking through a, a problem that involves DXF creation, manipulation, import SolidWorks, sketch manipulation, and it'll end up with something that I think you'll be glad you have. So uh, that's pretty much what we're gonna do today. Homework two as a reminder is doing the fourth. Keep that in mind. I, I, I don't want to extend it. Um, office hours, office hours today. And then if you'd like to have your, your motor mounts printed with the nylon printer, send me your STLs by tomorrow noon. I'm going to send them to Alyssa. And I'm just going to put them all in there, sort it out, tell me when they're going to be finished. But I think I can print all of them at once, which is cool. All right, any questions? Before we get started? Good. Okay, so this kind of like summarizes where we are. We, we uh, went through kind of a specking analysis where we made our decisions about what it is that we're building, its transmission ratio, how much current voltage is going to need. And now, now we're talking about, okay, now we've made some decisions about specking. How do we make a robot? We've gone through like three main uh, approaches. There's additive manufacturing, which builds parts of 3D, laser cutting, and water jetting. Laser cutting and water jetting are all 2D, but you can kind of, if you're clever in the way that you design, you can build really cool looking 3D parts from these 2D parts. <clears throat> this is just kind of reviewing how we create DXF files. We're gonna, we're gonna do this today. But this is, you can take it to part. This is exporting a DXF file. I'm actually gonna give you something a little bit different, but we'll get to that. <clears throat> Where you take it apart, you're gonna create the DXF file, and we have to color it indicate to the laser cutter what we wanted to cut, what we wanted to raster, and then we can, then we can print it. A lot of you guys are doing that uh, yesterday in lab, which is great. This talks about creating DXF files, right-clicking on a face. Um, it's, it's really kind of trivial. This was pretty neat. We talked about flexure design, which is one of the cool things you can do with a laser cutter. Um, these are different types of flexures, and they call them lattices when they're sort of arranged in this way. Then we talked through different types of lattices. Most, we spent most of our time talking about the straight uh, lattice hinge, which is kind of shown there. We talked about how its dimensions, how those dimensions affect its properties. But this is the kind of design, flexion design, that you would do kind of by trial and error. It's, these are not the same type of kind of precision design elastic elements that maybe you'll see in other places. I'll actually talk a little bit about that when we talk about water jetting flexures. So this kind of shows you these different parameters, how it affects the lattice. <clears throat> and then we showed a whole bunch of different types of lattices. And you guys were provided with a file that looks something like this, which would let you build your own lattices for kind of whatever you wanted to do. So <clears throat> we talked through making joints. This works for both laser cutting and water jetting. So we make these little tabs, they fit in, that helps give the material, some structure. Then we needed to add a small tolerance to that to make assembly easy. We were adding about a quarter millimeter. <coughs> we talked about putting fasteners inside. This is also gonna be very similar to what we do with water jetting. You can put a fastener inside that cut, it pulls the, the nut for you, and you don't have to get a wrench in there. It's awesome. And then stacking is really cool. It's not quite clear to me how this would factor into robotics or your project, but it seems like there's a way. Mostly it's just really neat. 
It's a really, really neat like, process of creating things, and it can be done, if you have a solid model, you can use these programs to slice it in this way for stacking. It's pretty neat. At some point, I'm going to do that. Personally, I'm interested in that. Talk about water jetting. Also a really cool process. It uses an ultra high pressure, tiny stream of water mixed with an abrasive garnet, and it punches through basically any material. The one we have cuts up to how thick. How, how thick is ours? You can wick up up to one inch. Anybody know like what an industrial water jet, how thick it can cut? Up to like 12 to 18 inches. <laughs> you can find pictures of giant parts cut through a, with a water jet. It looks like, like it shouldn't be possible. But that's sort of a, another class of water jetting, and it wouldn't be possible from the water jet here, at least the water jet in FRB. The water jet in GG Brown could probably do much better than the one we have in FRB. Yeah? Well, if you ever use a water jet over a laser cutter. A laser cutter can't really cut metal. So it's really like people who work with metal. And like one thing that's common for a water jet, for example, it would be, let's say you're machining a giant part and you need to mill it. Five axis mill is a huge part. That could take a really, really long time. It'd be expensive if you were just milling everything. What they can do is make a low fidelity cut with a water jet and then post machine with a mill. And it speeds up manufacturing. It's like a much better way to do it. Yeah. Um, I think I know the answer, but why water jet over plasma cut? Plasma cutters are like also a great tool. The main reason would be like plasma cutters have heat affected zones. So like so now imagine you're, you're cutting this part, you have a giant part you're trying to machine, you're gonna water jet it first, and then you're gonna uh, mill it after that. Could you do that with a plasma cutter? Probably not, because it's been warped. And it's it's gonna be warped and work hardened, and heat hardened. So like now you're trying to mill like a hardened piece of metal, which is like much different. <laughs> but I think if you sort of look around, like if you search for water cutting, a lot of things will contrast water cutting with plasma cutting and other types. There's a few other types of cutting that they're more industrial, that I don't know too much about them, mm -hmm. but like the main issue is the heat. Yeah. Are those large water or jets that um, can do whatever, like a floor or a foot, um, is the, like, I guess the radius of like the incision for that cut, is it larger than for the small ones? Or like, do you have to take into account like a large, a larger gap when you cut it um, versus the small ones? I don't ones? think so, but I'm not 100% sure because I've never used a water jet to do something <laughs> like that. But like I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think it would be the same. That much more, or it's time. It goes slower, so oh, it takes time to, to go through it, as opposed to to being something different. That's usually time. Yeah. Um, are water jet cutters generally slower than other options, or is the water like just as efficient? No, they're pretty fast. I'd say. I think they're similar speed to laser cutting. I mean, if you go faster, it'll be rougher. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're, they're considered to be pretty fast. They're a rapid prototyping tool. You get a reasonably consistent edge quality, which is cool. So these cuts, they look good, especially if you do it with a high quality setting. We talked about the kerf in a water jet, um, which is going to be larger than a, than a laser cutter. And the kerf's going to depend on a lot of things. Mostly it's going to depend on the nozzle. The diameter of the nozzle, the length of the nozzle, its cloniness. Anybody know like why? What what would a dirty nozzle do? Anybody, anybody think about that in terms of effort and flow? Yeah. It might disrupt the water and make it shoot out farther to the side than when you want it, and then it'll make that more clear. Yeah, I think it could definitely do things like that. It could change the trajectory. It could make it what, more difficult to cut. I would probably think of it as, it's like you have a resistor. That nozzle is a resistor. It's gonna pull pressure off of that stream. So it's flowing fluid through a resistance. This is just like current flowing through a resistor. So we're gonna lose pressure, we're gonna lose voltage drop. So the more loss there is in that nozzle, the rougher it is, the smaller the diameter, the more pressure we're gonna lose through that. The more pressure we lose, the more cutting power we lose. So like short nozzles will have a much higher pressure than long nozzles. Then why use long nozzles? I think that there's mixing. There's sort of a mixing process that occurs. They call it 
something, but when the garnet goes through in that tube after that, that's mixing the garnet in the water. And there's some, something to that on the manufacturing side. That length matters. <clears throat> cool. Okay, the different tapers. So depending, this is like your typical tapers and they kind of V-shaped. If you're going slow, it can be inverted, upside down V. And then if you're going through really large materials, you might get a barrel taper. So now it's going through here and it's spending more time in the center as it's drilling through a large, thicker material, and you might end up with a, a barrel shaped taper. Cool. Oh, I did ask about the garnet. Can we reuse garnet um, or recycle it? I asked Alyssa about that. She says it is possible, but very expensive to reuse garnet. They save all their garnet, they dry it out, and they provide it to a, to a dispose, waste disposal company. They do not try to try to recycle it. But it can be recycled. It just has to, all this, the particulate and metal has to come out of it. That's expensive. This is the water jet we have access to. It's currently down. I'm hoping it'll be up like soon. But it's a 12 by 12 inch bed. And you can cut 30,000 PSI, cut up to one inch. We talked about a couple of different aspects of creating designs. For the, the practical aspects of using a water cutter, you want to leave an edge to be able to, sometimes you clamp to the slats so that it doesn't move during cutting. Um, and if you're putting nesting parts inside, you want to leave some space between those parts, at least three and a half millimeters. This is designed with lines and arcs. So I would say like, if you can, if you're designing for a water jet and you can use lines and arcs instead of splines, it's probably worth doing. But I can't find anything that says that's still an issue. So this might be, might be fixed. OK, this is kind of where we ended. We're talking about bringing your file into Protomax layout and kind of things that you can do inside Protomax layout as part of using a water jet. It's going to be different than using a laser cutter. So things that you might want to do is change your quality settings. It's going to prompt you for the units. You can clean your drawing here, set your quality. It will like analyze your DXF and look for areas where it's, there's a mistake made, where it's created a tool path. And it looks like something's up. There's a gap. There's a kind of a place where it cuts the part and it shouldn't. So it'll kind of like go through that for you and find it. So you set your quality, and then you clean your drawing, and then you're kind of ready. And so now I talk through a few best practices, similar to, to laser cutting. It's going to be actually like pretty similar because it's a really similar process. Um, So similar to a laser cutter, we're talking about the fastener, including fasteners. This is the this is the way that I think is best. You can also obviously like create a hole and cap it. But I like to just capture these nuts. So like same kind of deal here. This nut is captured. We have some space for the for the fastener to protrude through, and that holds it. We don't need any um, we don't need any extra parts or or, or physical tools needed. Where can you guys find nut dimensions if you wanted to do this? Where would you find them? MasterCard. This is actually a part that we made for my lab. Um, it's a desktop mount. It's just water jet out of half-inch aluminum. It mounts a prosthesis to this is a special like, fixture. So this takes a half-inch piece of aluminum and five minutes of water jet cutting and builds a really awesome desktop mount to hold these processes that we build. Um, so it includes these exact kind of things, these fasteners. If you're oversizing, if you're adding fasteners, you've got to oversize that slot similarly. I'm going to oversize slot for nuts. I'm going to recommend 0.75 millimeters. To ensure that so you're going to give it 0.75 millimeters on the edge and get that nut in there. And when it makes contact, it's going to spin. It'll spin it a tiny bit until it contacts the edges, and then it'll hold it for you. Um, it makes disassembly and assembly is convenient and easy, which is a great part of rapid prototyping. 
Another thing you might wish to do, this is going to come back, we're going to come back to this when we do our uh, exercise today. Another thing you might want to do is like add text or small features with internal parts. So like the inside of an O. So on a water jet or, or a laser cutter, like you're going to lose that. As soon as it's cut, it's, going to, it's gone. So you might need to add small tabs or features to hold those. So for example, the inside Oh, then, oh. We can do this by adding tabs. Tabs are this, this, these kinds of things. These are tiny little tabs that that separate the main parts so that it doesn't, you don't lose the inside features. So when you do that, that's like a secondary operation that you would do in SolidWorks. So you'd realize, okay, I'm cutting this thing on a, on a laser cutter or a water jet. I need to handle this. So you would modify your sketch to do this. And it's, it's not hard. So tab width depends on water jet quality. There are different like, levels of quality, different fineness of garnet like we talked about. So that thickness of that tab is not super clear. It kind of depends. I'm going to say about a millimeter is safe. Probably could go a little bit less than that if you wanted. But you'll see in a second, if it's too close, it cuts the parts out. And then it's a bummer. OK, what I want to do right now is just, I'm going to kind of like talk through these. I have some demo parts. So these are two parts that we cut on a water jet. Um, they show the concept of, of holding in the fastener, even though like our net is like a little bit undersized, but don't worry about that. And then it also shows the text that I was just talking about. What's different about these is one was cut with a water jet quality of five, and one was cut with a water jet quality setting of one. So see if you can figure out which one was the high quality cut, and which one was the low quality cut. And then you'll see, try to see which one is, which side is the front and which side is the back. How could you tell? How could you tell which side is facing up? The side that has like the cut kind of going in would be the side that the water is hitting out and then the metal kind of escaping out unless it's been deburred. But like the burrs would be going out the back end. I don't know that you can really see that. Maybe right after it's cut, what you'll see is like, so if we think about our, what was our taper looking like? It's a V, yeah? And it's gonna be open at the bottom. So if you look at the back, the back is more blown out than the front. But you'll see it looks like worse. It's not as high fidelity cuts. So pass these around, or I guess the best way to do is pass these around. We're gonna have you guys all come up and look at them real fast. You haven't done the other way before. We'll see that. That's, that way it doesn't. Okay. So we're gonna kind of look through these, which should mess with them. So what you'll see is this is a quality job mark. If you want, you can kind of tell those edges are not super, super clean. This one is a quality job mark. So like that's the difference in cut quality. So it's not like, we I mean, other than kind of like right here, it looks pretty bad. But like it's not, it's not too different. And then you can see these were not held in like quite well enough on these old tabs. So we lost some of the inside features. But I want you guys to kind of mess with them. You can see we have a little bit of space in here, which is right for this to fit together. You can kind of like play with these, feel like they're extremely strong. You know, like they're just held in with, a couple of tiny fasteners, really one tiny fastener and some, and some male female parts. But like, those are like very easy parts to make that are incredibly strong and almost attractive. We'll modify them, I think, a little bit for the next time. So this was also cut on the water jet Gigi Brown. I'd like to do this for this class. I could do it with the water jet from FRB. So we'll redo this and we'll kind of space the letters out a little more. But it kind of gives you an idea of like what we're talking about and what the differences in quality actually mean. 
having seen this, I would probably recommend always doing a higher quality setting. Does doing a higher quality setting like increase the cost? Yes, increase the cost. So I don't know the home. I mean, my guess is it's not a ton of time. I suspect that those were very fast to pack. Maybe like two minutes. So pretty neat. So this gives you an idea of like capturing fasteners and water jetting and water jetting quality settings and then kind of cabbing in the sense of holding the inside the text. And you can see that that's going to be a little where we have to add, those, add some more space. We lost some of those inside of those letters. Then you look at the front and back, you can kind of see which side's the front. The back will be like less, like a lower fidelity cut. The lines aren't quite so straight. It's kind of like tape more taper. Cool, huh? Pretty neat. That's what a water jet does. You can build like all sorts of structures and machines out of this. So I think we can like let these just go around the room. So I'd say like look at them. We're gonna kind of go look at these, spend some time with them, and we'll unplug them together. Cool. This is my lab name, by the way. So that is. <laughs> no, it just cut them off. Yeah, we lost them. Right. That is like a little pads are too narrow. And we lost them. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to kind of like a different concept of water jetting and tabbing, just tabbing many parts together. And this is a, this is a common process. We began to talk about this before. So once the water jet part is cut, fall into the water bath beneath the water jet. And you do not want that. So there are stainless steel slats underneath the water jet cutter that's kind of cutting the part on. So if it's big enough to span those slats, then you're sort of okay, it'll stay in there. You still might get knocked if the water, you know, if water has hit or something, it still could fall in. But if it's between the slats or smaller, it'll, it won't, it'll fall in the water. So sometimes that's inconvenient and people come up with a solution for that, which is tabbing. A tab is a small, piece of material that connects your part to the workpiece. It's a bridge. You can kind of see it here and then through there. Like, just like in like old plastic models where you break the parts off. So tabbing can be added manually in Protomax. What's Protomax? <coughs> it's the, like, yeah, it's both the name of the water jet and the software. Protomax layout is its full name. Or in SolidWorks. I'm gonna show you how to add them in Protomax layout and then we're gonna add them together in SolidWorks. This is good practice if you're cutting many small parts. Okay, so this is how you do it in Protomax layout. So you would open your part, Protomax layout, right click on it, click the lead I.O. button. So we have our, like, for example, it might look like this. We're gonna right click on a line segment and select create tab. And then you just click where you want the tab. Once you are creating this tab, it'll pop up a dialog. It lets you like customize the sizing of that tab. The set of parameters, this is in Protomax, the set of parameters include the part side gap, which they're calling A tip. Side gap, which they call C. Lead 
in and out, which they call D, and total tab length F. So you select these, set these numbers, and it will just build the tab for you. So that's cool. And then you can just repeat for multiple tabs. And I'm kind of like recommending one to three millimeter tabs. So not like a huge deal, but just something to know about. This is a pretty cool little cool, uh, process they have added to that software. That's it on tabbing. I'm talking about flexures. Um, Water jet flexures. Oh, yeah. Um, is it one, one millimeter, one to three millimeters width or length? Width. Length will probably be more defined by like your part and its layout on your sheet. Um, so designing flexures with a water jet. So since water just cut metal, flexures of metal have another name. We call those springs. And springs, we design springs with metal, it's moving away from rapid prototyping and into like just straight up engineering design. So that's outside of the scope of this class, but I kind of wanted to show you that all the same con concepts from, we're talking about laser cutting, flexures, some of those exist here, plus a lot more. And this is an example like from a research project that's going on in my lab. Um, this is the uh, prosthesis, we're looking at a knee prosthesis, we're looking at it has a belt drive transmission in there, so that's a, this is the knee joint, and it's output pulley. And so it's maybe kind of this big. Inside that output pulley, we can stack a bunch of discs, spring discs that look like this. These springs are just radial cantilever beams that interface with a gear, essentially a gear like camshaft, like this. So whenever this rotates, it just deflects all of those little individual beams and acts like a spring. Um, we've developed not just kind of straight ones, but you develop curvy ones that, that actually have more energy density. Um, but we have developed all of the equations to, to predict the mechanics of those springs from their shapes. It looks something like this. This is just an example of the relationships that exist in this. This would say that the spring <laughs> in this particular case is a relationship that's based on the spring thickness, the number of those radial flexures, the design stress, the length of the flexures, elastic modulus of the material, the, the contact radius of that little gear thing, and the desired spring stiffness. But this type of spring, this, we cut these on a wire EDM, which is a machining process we're not going to talk about, but these could be cut on a, on a water jet. So we could make these springs on a water jet. We'd have to like, be a little more careful on tolerancing and accounting for curve, but I think that it's, I think it's possible. So. This is the kind of thing you could do with a water jet. It's actually not just rabbit prototype, but design really, really cool springs. That actually, like, this is all, this is really new. This is a new type of spring we developed, which is, just comes from a 2D part. Um, these are other springs, like this. Lots of people would make springs that, that are like this. This is a spring that rotates, so it's a torsional spring. And we have lots of different example springs by other research groups. All, almost all of these can be cut with a water jet. So not only is a water jet like, great for rapid prototyping, but you can also do some pretty sophisticated and thorough engineering with it. So that's outside the scope of this class, but I want you to know that it's possible. And it's pretty neat. Cool. Any questions on that? Yeah. For actually fitting the gear into like the springs, how it's fit there, like I mean how exact does the tolerances have to be because I guess it's gears are pretty exact it's hard to actually get every single tooth in yeah this is so this is made with a wire EDM and it's a custom profile so it's not it's like a gear but it's not it's not actually a gear profile it is involute but we just cut it with wire EDM mm -hmm. so we what is wire EDM I might have missed you saying that sorry wire EDM is a machine is a manufacturing process for where an electrically charged piece of metal or wire does the cut okay gotcha and it's, you can so it's much more exact you can, so the kerf for a wire EDM can be like on the orders of six to 15 microns. So it's really, really, really fine cutting. Um, that's why we use it. 
but we probably could do it out of a wider test, maybe. especially that little, the little that we have, which is has a really like fine nozzle, and these are really small springs, so they could probably do these, but I'm not sure. We'd have to probably adjust in some way, but that is something interesting that I'd love to try. Cool. So yeah, spring example, metal flexures. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff with a water jet. Okay, so this is what we're actually going to do today. This is what I want you to do. So we're basically finished with manufacturing. This is the last thing. So we've done specking, we've done prototyping and manufacturing, and now we're going to, then we're going to move to kind of layouts, uh, transmissions, mechatronics, and control. So we're not going to come back to manufacturing. So before we exit it, I wanted to do like a thorough and class example where everyone does it individually. We can walk around and help and just make sure that everyone's comfortable with these tools. Here's what I, this is the quiz position, by the way. Okay. And there's a Canvas assignment open where you can end up putting your file in. Um, you can place it on paper quiz. Um, so what we want you to do is you're going to create an extruded cut. Actually, not a boss. It should be a cut. Um, an extruded cut of the M Robotics It's going to look something like this. What I actually want you to do, well, we're going to do a little, a little, we're going to do a little bit different than this. So I'm going to want you to grab the AI, AI file from Canvas, open it up, and export it as a DXF, import it into SolidWorks, or create a plate. Like imagine you're water jetting something, you want a plate of, we're going to say, 3 16 thickness. So create a 3 16 plate. Put that, that DXF on that plate and extrude cut it. But before you extrude cut it, take the like ROB, take the B, flip it around, turn it into a three. Take the I's, turn them into ones. So what you should end up with is something like this, but also you should have Rob 311. Underneath it? Wherever you want. So I, what all I'm looking for is a is a plate that has these cut through it, and it'll look like something you could water jet. I want you to add the tabs to hold the letters. And so what this will be is something that you can then use. So then you can, if you wanted to include an Robotics logo, for example, on your ball bot, you'll have the sketch to copy and paste. So I'll maybe do it alongside you, but I want you guys to do it without looking at me doing it. So go to Canvas, go to File for Lecture, Lecture Town. We should be doing it says mrobotics.logo.ai. Is it clear what you're doing? You're going to create a, a, a extruded cut that says the M Robotics logo, and it says Rob 311, and you're going to manipulate sketches to make that happen. You got to add the tabbing. So I didn't do that here. In this drawing, I just sort of extruded it to give you an idea of what we're doing. But you're going to add the tabs, so you have to you have to manipulate those sketches. Put in your kind of like approximately one millimeter tabs that hold in the inside of the letters, and then create a 311. I have a ton of mice up here.
logging into my K computer. We do it together. Ready to launch. Six, yeah. I haven't seen a time jump. You haven't seen a time jump. I wasn't expecting to do that. You have to sign in. Do you know what What's the first thing that you're going to do? What's step one here? Export. <coughs> well, open Illustrator and then export. Yes. So you should end up opening it. It should look something like this. Help if I plug this in. Mm -hmm. 
Should we import it as a uh, SolidWorks drawing or should we sketch? You should import it. You should do like select base or play to the sketch on. When I try to open it. Sure, that works, yeah. What you want to do not as rep, just do that you want to check that. So when you're importing it in the solid work, it's going to ask you if you want to include it as a reference, is that what it says? Yeah. Yeah, don't uncheck uncheck that. That's going to make it so you can't edit it. We're going to want to be able to edit it. Are you sure? You'll open it up in the Illustrator, export it as a DXF. I have the option, like when I am importing it, it says like create new SolidWorks drawing or import, or sorry, import as new part, or import to new part as like a 2D sketch or. Yeah, as a sketch. Don't make it, don't let it do. Yeah, don't import as reference. Yes. So you're doing import, like whatever process you're doing to bring that DX7 is not the same process that I use, but it seems like it works. Hmm. Open. You said not to click the reference, right? Yeah, uncheck the reference part. And then one thing I also think that would be good for you guys to do is to scale it. Because oftentimes you'll be dealing with images or, or files that you need to scale for some reason. So if you're just using this without scaling it, then if you ever have to do that in the future, you, you know, it would be good to practice scaling it. So I would try to scale that in robotics logo. I'll do kind of like this with you. Let's Oh, I see. You're talking about this dialog. Yeah, we keep it as import parts to sketch. Uncheck that. There it is. I got that warning too. Do you just click yes? Say that again? I got the same. Do you just click yes to that warning? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. So you should end up with something else like that. Does it matter how thick we make our tabs? No. Yeah. I mean, if you use it, you want to tell make them as small as you can. How do you scale? We ever talk, we haven't really talked about scaling. If you want, so everybody get to here, and then if you want, I'll go through scaling real fast. Yeah. Yeah, that's like an image. Yeah. So delete that thing. You have it as a DXF, correct? Yes. Okay, so click on a plane. I think you're in. You're just adding lines to connect. You're, you just closed. Cl like you're adding like, like two-dimensional? 
parts. You want a new part. Okay, that's okay. Now you're in a part. Okay, and you're in a sketch. So exit the sketch. Or insert. So like that, that little arrow will bring some things forward. That, that, that guy, I would pin that thing down. And then, there you go. Now it's going to prompt you. Yep. Oh, okay. Kind of you. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to scale it so that then you could decide how much, how big you want it. Like in your, let's say you wanted to laser cut this into your ball box. Do you guys want to see a scale? Are you guys, are you guys all in that spot? Okay, I'm just going to scale this. There's two ways to scale. At least two. There's probably lots. There's many ways to scale this. I'm going to I'm going to show you guys how I scale it, which is scale scaling inside the sketch. So I'm going to right click, or I'm actually in the sketch already. So I'm going to select this thing. Under move, so I'm like inside the sketch, I've selected it. Under move is something called scale. Scale entities. I'm gonna scale this. So it's asked, brings up like, shows me all the lines I've selected to scale. And now all I have to do is select a scale factor and a point to scale about. I'm gonna pick the middle. Scale about, let's say this, oops, it's not that guy. Oh no, it seems to have gotten it. So I want to scale about the end of that. How do I know like how big this is? What what could I use in SolidWorks to tell me that? Measure. Measure. Yes. Okay, so I'm just gonna scale it up by two. So there, you see it's scaling. So you can scale it however you want it. There's a, and then I'll probably go through the other way of scaling too, where you can scale not the sketch, but the feature. Are we cutting and creating? You guys good? Oh, it's just a tab. <laughs> Where is that? Yeah, but where is that? Is that the library? Or is that the library? 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 Is that the Can you just make that all files? I'm seeing that one. Okay. Yeah, he was just looking for SolidWorks specific files. Yeah, so this is scaling. So here you're scaling the feature. Because you're not inside, can you go down sketch? You're not, yeah. in, you're not inside the sketch. Mm -hmm. Click on the sketch there. Yeah, so you're out, you're editing the feature right now as opposed okay. to the sketch that makes that feature. Okay. And then that's also a viable way to do this. Okay. So that works. Because when I went into the sketch, I You're not right now? Yeah. yeah. Yep. It, so 
So you are at least you're comfortable with scale again. But yeah, I think I think it should work now. You have to go after like it. So, uh, like, for add actually adding the tabs, uh, like, I want to, like, actually smart dimension the distance between these two, mm -hmm. but it, since nothing is actually fixed, it just is going to, like, for example, if I do this, it's going to move the whole yeah. circle. Is there a way that we can actually just fix all the sketch? Or? Dimension it or okay. lock it. <clears throat> How do you lock it? Because, like, there's no, I wasn't... Fix. You click on the line on the left side. Yeah, but it didn't let me fix everything. When I selected all of it, like, I would have yeah, to, like, go through and select or yeah, fix yeah. every line. I like that. Okay. I mean, really, it's supposed to be all... Dimension. Yeah. So, but the only way would be to fix it with an anchor point. Okay. Should, okay, should we just then, like, eyeball the tabs for now? So yeah, I think it's... I mean, so what I would do is, if I were doing this, I would do this. And then I would just trim. Okay, yeah, that's what I was doing. Yeah. So just kind of eyeball all of it? I think that's fine. Okay. <laughs> as long as your width is large enough that you would be okay to be cut on a laser cutter or a water jet. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, when we're manipulating logos and images like this, it's sort of, it, we don't usually end up with black sketches. Yeah. And it adds a little challenge. I was hoping there would just be an easy way to fix fix everything if you have like this undefined sketch.
Is this getting extruded all the way through? All right, all right, there you go. There you yeah. Go. Select a plane that you want to put the DXF on. For that, yeah. and then just do insert. So click that little arrow. Yep. Pin that thing down if you want. And you insert. going for a second. You guys want to see like, so maybe right now we're trying to make like a, these tabs that hold the inside of this O, and we have this issue and the sketches are blue and the lines are moving around, so like how could we do that in a way where it's clean and symmetric? that's also able to be done in this particular setup with this blue sketches. So I can show you how to do that. You guys want to talk through real fast, like how to make, how we can make this, the, the cutouts or tabs that hold the inside of the O, how we can make those symmetric and dimension properly, even though it's a blue sketch using relationships. Do you guys want to do that and see that? So like we want these, we want to make this cutout. We want that to be a dimension that we can control. But this sketch is blue, since we import it from a DX app, it's going to move around and change and warp. So what I've done here is create some center lines. So those are lines that don't have, like, they're just for, for convenience, these dash lines. So I created a dash line down the center. I created a line here from the center to one of these vertical cuts. I made that one 0.4 millimeters. And then I made another line down here. I made those two equal and these two parallel. So now, like, it should be centered and attractive, and the only thing I have to do next is trim it.
Is there a way for it to tell you where like a sketch is not is broken, where it doesn't make an enclosed object? Yeah, if you try to exit the sketch, it's, or like exit the sketch into a feature. Yeah, yeah. It, or it's just like it's not allowing me to cut through the M, which I didn't edit, so it must have just like I might have imported it a little, or like messed around with it because I have all the other parts selected to cut through, but I just can't select the M, which it's like it's telling me it's not a closed feature because I can't actually. Like, really closely at it. Let's okay. see if there's something up with it. Yeah, because like I was zooming in on all the points. I don't really see any. I didn't mess with this at all. Like try to drag them and see if they. Yeah, that's connected. So like I just one of them's probably not connected. Okay. <clears throat> Has anybody extruded the M? Okay, I don't think we're. I don't think we're quite there yet. I mean, we. I did this recently, and it worked fine. Hmm. But we did make a couple changes at the last minute. I mean, it's possible I like messed with one of the line backs, on, but they all look to be connected. Is your, is your M closed, the one that you just imported? I haven't tried to, to well, true yet. If you see how like those are gray, like if you like, oh, okay, so it's not doing it for the R, so. Like mine do that for like if it's a closed part mm -hmm. automatically. Just want it as a SolidWorks part on Canvas.
I have it done, but it looks—it's giving me. I have to, there's an open contour somewhere. So I have to track that down before we're running out of time. Yeah, 
You have to create a feature for boss. <laughs> What's it doing? Is it like lets me select this. Here's an open contour. No, mine will have it filled. Yeah, okay. Not Rob 311 at the moment. Well, ideally, ideally, you would say Rob 311. Okay. I uploaded it with just 311. I forgot that you wanted the Rob part. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> upload the, the solid part. Okay. Have you ever, like, you tried it this? Move your plate. So, this looks like something you could water jet. It looks like a water jet part. These are the files you could use to water jet. And now you can also use it to. It and this is how you can take like a logo and transform it into something you can design your own. You can also like laser cut this on like a, the acrylic, so make like an acrylic plate. For sure. Okay. You can do anything you want with this. This is one. That's the reason. Why, one of the reasons why we did this exercise is to not only expose you to this, but to give you this like CSS. Now you can use it for any change. So we're not going to do this any further in next class. It looks like most of you guys are done. We're close. So it doesn't matter, honestly. Solid part or SDF file. Solid part actually is a little, a little better. Just because there's more for me to look at and see how you did it, but um, I'm having trouble with the three. With what? The three, like cutting off three for some reason. I don't know. Should I see contour? It's like look at look at like look right there. It's a great looking three, by the way. 
better than my three. Look right in the center. Look right there. Go all the way in there. Zoom, zoom, all the way in. So you're open line right there. If it's not, if you haven't, if it's not creating or, or if you're not seeing these turn blue, one thing you might check is in here, right there. So watch if I zoom in. It's like mine has a little line segment. Oh, it actually has a problem. But like, see, so somehow when this was created, it didn't, it didn't fully capture that line. And that was an open, that was an open segment, so it would fade. it would not have let me go forward without that. So you might have to look at where they like the small edges come together and zoom in if there's an issue. Yeah. I guess so. This is designed in Illustrator, so this like, lettering was not designed in SolidWorks. You designed it in Illustrator and then you export it. Yeah. So if you wanted to do something with like that, it's probably easier to do it. So what's your Any vector graphic, yeah, you can manipulate in Illustrator or Inkscape. Save it as a as a DXF, bring it into SolidWorks. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's the process. Okay, class is over. We have to go. Wow, what kind of a file do you want us to submit for? SolidWorks or SDR. Or whatever you have. Um, okay, so we, we will see you next week. Come to office hours. Come talk to me about homework. It's making me nervous that no one's coming to talk to me about it. So come talk to me, please. Come on,